Uh, good morning and welcome to another episode of Crime Pays a Bad Need Doesn't. Today I'm coming to you from uh, the northern part of the North Island, kind of near Auckland, New Zealand, to talk specifically about this tree, Libocedrus plumosa. This is a Gondwanan relict of the Redwood family, Cooper Stacey. Now I'm just going to start the video off just going right ahead and showing you these beautiful sprays of foliage. Decussate scales on either side of that, that central axis. Gorgeous as hell. Look at the bark. Kind of spiraling around. Looks like it'd be in a redwood family. Looks almost kind of like a, a cryptomeria or a sequoia. But uh, it's uh, pretty endangered. It's pretty rare. Only occurs in the northern part of the North Island of New Zealand. The genus Libocedrus that it's a part of is a remnant of Gondwana. So certainly these were probably growing uh, in Antarctica 20 million years ago, 50 million years ago at uh, various periods before it froze over. But either way, a really cool uh, remnant of these coniferous forests that used to uh, occur in the southern hemisphere, you know, during the Cretaceous, tens of millions of years ago, probably up until, you know, 10, 20 million years ago, and then it just kind of landlocked here. Uh, you don't get any libel cedars in Australia, it's a little too dry, but it's landlocked here in New Zealand, New Caledonia. So anyway, we're going to take a walk into this forest, these cool temperate rainforests, check out some of the other plants that are growing here, some of the other rainforest trees, and we're going to get uh, a, a look at some of the larger specimens uh, of this really cool member of the redwood family, Libo cedrus. So there you go. Let's go check it out. Got wonderful displays of all the conifers there. Look at that, Podocarpus totara. There's the trunk down there. Massive beast. You can see it's uh, acting uh, It's a very nice substrate for the lichen. Right there you got a very old Decritium capressinum, the Remu. Subtended with an understory of Podocarpus totara and a Ropolostylus sapidus. New Zealand's only native palm. A very cold tolerant palm too, you can see it right there. With that little cat of nine tails of uh, fruits. So that's where it flowers, it flowers out of the base of those those sheath leaves. Look at that, look at that Remo, Christ. You rarely see them that large. The pendant foliage. Over here we got the Dacrocarpus decritioides with a wonderful illustration of how it gets its seeds out there. The seed is that uh, black thing on top of there. It's basically, it's like a cone. These are conifers. These are, these are naked seeds, they're gymnosperms. And then that orange part is, of course, uh, what acts as the little bait berry, the bait arrow. It's technically not a not a berry uh, that uh, attracts the bird dispersal. So the birds go for that orange bit, and then, of course, inadvertently end up swallowing that seed or spitting it out somewhere. And uh, that's how these get around. And of course, the juvenile foliage looks much different from the adult foliage. You can see you've got these very uh, tightly packed needles here. They're more splayed out uh, when they're young. You can get very large. Kehekatea is a common name. Though I'm probably mispronouncing all these Maori names, so whatever. It's, it's the joy of being an obnoxious American, I guess. Ugh, I just ate the orange bit to one of those. Not that bad, but the seed is definitely pretty resinous. Pretty piney. Touchmypodocarpium.com. That's the namesake of the whole family, Podocarpaceae. Foot to the ovary, foot to the seed. Get the lycophytes. You got a huperzia now. I believe that's in a phlegmarius. Phlegmarius. That dangling lycophyte. And of course, you got that earina orchid right there, looking like a grass just popping off. Looks like a microsorum up top. That fern. Epiphytes on everything. So Astelia is a very species-rich genus in the uh, order Asparagales is in its own family, Asteliaceae, and here's an epiphytic one, looks like Astelia histata. And like so many plants here, it's adapted to bird dispersal with those conspicuous red droops on the inflorescence. It was probably blooming, I don't know, quite a few months ago, four or five months ago, now it's going off. But it's, that plant is everywhere, it's epiphytic on, on so many of the surrounding trees, Rimu, not the agathis too much. Look at that massive Cyathea medullaris. Look, nice texture on Aropolo stylus. Scars made by the uh, old leaves abscising. You know, look how inflated they are at the base of that leaf blade. Wonderful patterning, especially when everything's covered in moss and epiphytes. 
feel like I'm in a, a virtual dungeon of ferns. So even though you see these palms, it's not warm. It's chilly. Oh look, it's one of the epiphytic climbing metrosideros. Those red flowers. Obviously bird pollinated. Myrtaceae is the family, the eucalyptus family. See, just climbing that rope of stylus, that palm. Look, it is just another species of caprosma, right? Not much to look at. Opposite leaves, coffee family, rubiaceae. But flip it over and look at that russety brand. That's pretty nice. You can see those purple leaf veins too. Caprosma arborea. All caprosma are wind pollinated, of course. You can see this guy's just forming a little tree in the understory of this cori forest. So Cory's the dominant tree here, Agathis australis. You can see you got a handful of uh, other other trees. You got Phyllocladus uh, trichomanes. You got uh, the Critium capressinum, the Rimu, Dacrocarpus, of course, and then uh, that distinct bark of Libocedrus plumosa. Look at that beautiful cup cuprisaceae bark. Look at that. See, the higher we get on this ridge, the more these trees appear. What a nice cypress, nice southern hemisphere cypress. Yeah, distinct shredding bark. You know how much libocedrus was there uh, on Antarctica back in the day, but there was, but there was a, quite a bit, or at least the most recent common ancestor. You got Fitzroy, Pilgerodendron, all these cool Southern Hemisphere members of the redwood family, Calitris. Look, there's a seedling. See, look, it's got juniper leaves when it's young, and then now uh, you can see that first initial spray, that flat spray of scales starting to uh, starting to form. On a mossy bank, a, a wet mossy bank. Again, probably the only place these would stand a chance in hell of surviving are uh, on the west coast, Pacific Northwest. See, they're not dominant. They're certainly not dominant, but they become uh, more abundant when you start getting more light. So I'm guessing they're probably not as adapted to shade as a lot of the podocarps are. See, there you, there's one, there's one back there. Real nice one right there. Yeah, it just, looks just like Calicedrus the Currens bark. Or West Coast the Incense Cedar, which again is not a cedar. All these, all these members of the Redwood family called cedars that have no relation to cedar whatsoever. I mean, they do if you go back far enough, everything is. You know, we're related to fish technically. There you go, there's two more trees. And they're definitely not that large. So not a, not a dominant component of the forest here and they definitely seem to like more light. Strikingly beautiful though, regardless. Only member of the redwood family here in New Zealand. And you got Anthrotaxis down there in Tasmania. When did, when did the, last, the two last grow together? In Antarctica maybe, 20 million years ago? Nice track of film over there. You can see Agatha's just dominating. It's so weird. The most dominant component of these forests. It's doing better than all the podocarps. Here's an interesting one, a cool member of the nettle family. Kind of looking like a begonia almost, at least in the, those stems. Uh, this is a member of Urticaceae. This is a Latostema rugosum. And you can see those uh, axile fruits right there. So you can get a couple better ones right here. Axile flowers, axile fruits. How juicy that thing is. Turns into a little little capsule. And they could form uh, colonies, quite large colonies, up to you know, 10, 12 feet wide. Here you go, Piper Excelsum. Look at that bract that subtends the uh, that, that shoot right there. It's like a translucent bract. It smells like saffron. It smells like root beer a little bit. Got the saffron in it. Maybe you can make MDMA out of it. Doesn't get that big though. See, it tops out at, I don't know, eight feet. Beautiful plant here in the understory though. That Dacrocarpus decridioides, look how big that fucking, oh my God, you get all that astelia up there. Ah, oh, that thing's huge. And they grow relatively slow. I mean, they're like medium, medium pace. So this has got to be very old. Look at those roots. God, I love podocarps. Don't you love podocarps? On the look at that totara, look at it. Jesus Christ, that's huge. I'm gonna step over its root here. So th this has gotta be hundreds of years old at least. I mean, 
And it doesn't have that straight upright form. It's growing more like a large U, but they can certainly grow, have more of an upright form too. Just look at that. Look at, look at everything growing up there too. So much epiphytism. Uh, no, nah, that's because my mech's too old. Way too old. Look at how big that is. You really need to see everybody too to get an idea of scale of this fucking beast. God, podocarps are so wonderful. And it's so sad that so many people in the Northern Hemisphere will never know of them. Or if they do, they'll just think it's that Home Depot plant. The macrophylla that you buy everywhere. Right here you got the Carinocarpus lavigatus. Order is Cucurbitales, the order of cucumbers. But uh, it's in its own family, Carinocarpaceae. And reportedly it's quite toxic. The fruit is very toxic. You know, but it's got the alternate leaves, which is notable, not, not opposite alternate leaves. They're kind of glabrous and rubbery. It appears to be sedimentary. You can see the uh, bedding planes. It's like some nice uh, sandstone that's been flipped up horizontally. You know, sometimes it's nice to just take a big clusterfuck of people out to the forest and go look at stuff, you know? Go look at all kinds of stuff. Go look at all kinds of different ferns, fungi, and uh, podocarpaceae. Oh, that's Bovaria, huh? We don't know what species, though, huh? Just go into town. What would you call it? A wetter? A witter. Wetter. W-E-T-A. Oh, W-E-T-A. Jesus Christ. I don't know what attacks him. Savage. You know, it kind of blows my mind that uh, were it not for a few chance tectonic events, podocarps would be extinct right now. They've basically been, you know, most of the species in the family have basically been saved in, in little island areas. I mean, you got quite a few... Uh, Got, got quite a few in uh, Australia, but Australia has been drying out and podocarps do not like drying continents. So were it not for New Zealand, New Caledonia, a couple of the other islands in the area, a lot of this diversity would be lost. Got quite a few in South America too, but nowhere near as much diversity of podocarpaceae in South America as uh, Australasia. We got Phyllocladus trichomonoides here, one of I think three species in New Zealand, maybe four. But uh, Michael was just telling me that the wood is extremely hard. It'll blunt your chainsaw, which you wouldn't normally think from a conifer. Now, as we get a little higher, you see the, the whole composition of forest changes. It changes from podocarps over there, nice decritium, capresidum, to uh, kunzia, which is in a eucalyptus family, myrtaceae. Let me see. Get out of here. These tree ferns and stuff. There you go. And kunzia is ectomycorrhizal. So maybe we'll see a little bit more fungal diversity uh, in this forest. Got this understory of ferns as well. Cyanthia. I believe it's Medullaris. Nope, it's Dilbata. Look at that. Look at that incredible leaf. Bright white abaxial surfaces. Ah! Oh. Little phyllocladus seedlings. Look at that thick fibrous insulating bark. You don't get fires here, but lots of members of this family in Australia use that bark uh, as a fire protection. Protecting that the supple cambium. Yeah, there we go. There's the cordonarius, huh? No action. We got a drosera right above it. So it must be somewhat, nitrogen must be somewhat inaccessible on these soils. In more Bavaria? There you go, nice illustrations of two Myrtaceous bastards that look a lot alike, okay? Right here you got Kunzia on the left and Leptospermum scoparium on the right, aka Manuka. And uh, there's the uh, Kunzia when it's full grown, forming a nice little uh, mini bonsai forest. And of course, both these being in Myrtaceae, the eucalyptus family, associate with a wide variety uh, of uh, ectomycorrhizal fungi, especially in the genus Cordonarius. And here's the uh, fruits, the woody capsules, and at the Leptospermum scoparium. See, but you can see, I mean, <laughs> the leaves are not, they're not stunners here. See, see the Leptospermum's got a little bit broader of a leaf and um, perhaps they're a little bit more spaced out as well on uh, the stem. Oh, it betrays the, the volcanic nature of uh, a lot of the geology here. You got sandstone, old, like that 250 million year old sandstone mixed with a lot younger volcanism. Because we are in a clusterfuck of plate tectonics. Nice piece of scoria. Got the saying pure oil. That's nice. Oh, yeah, you put some of that on. I got it for the chiggers. And then by mistake, I put some on my scrotum once and I burned myself. You know, the next day I just I had a horrible burn on the bottom of my testicles. 
So you got Philocletus coming up in the understory, but it's going to have a hard time out competing this Kunzia. See, very dense. All right, light is not the issue. It's probably the, the fucking mass of roots, of sprawling roots. Yeah, look at this. You got Philocletus everywhere. Oh, and the dreaded gorse. Oh, oh, Ulex. Fabaceae, it's a pea. Horrible. What kind of jackass brought... How'd this get here? What kind of jackass brought this in? Huh? From Europe. Oh, look, we got a relative of manzanita and blueberries. Leucopogon fasciculatus. From Ericaceae, the blueberry family. But, of course, it's in the Apacrid subfamily, so it's got that parallel leaf venation, and it looks nothing like what you would assume a member of Ericaceae to look like if you were in North America. And there's those nascent inflorescences. See? About to droop down those, uh, those pendant flowers, bearded flowers. Nice pomaderis, which is a buckthorn. Ramnaces, the family there. Those flowers aren't open yet. Because it's winter here, but look at the leaves. Gorgeous, huh? Bright white abaxial surfaces, fuzzy. And a nice, uh, a nice beige stem. God, that bovaria fungus is everywhere. Jesus Christ, another, another insect that got murked. Entomopathogenic fungus. Oh, yeah, look at that. It's a wasp. Jesus Christ. No holds barred. Brutal. Wasn't much mushroom diversity down there in the podocarp forest, not surprisingly, but down here, we're getting a lot of nice stuff. Ugh. A nice little moss bed, too. So we put the, let's see if there's a potassium hydroxide reaction. Not much on the top. Let's try and do this. No. No pink spores. No, pink good. spores. Well, pinky. Pinky brown. That would match up. Pinky with the purple. Aroma. That was the kind of colored spores that the aroma I found. Veil still. Oh yeah. So you guys are thinking hebaloma. Yeah. Sure. You said you said hebaloma victorianus. Yeah, victorianus. 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 I'm gonna call it victorianus. <laughs> doesn't smell too bad. It's got kind of a nice smell to it. Ugh. They're called poison pies. Um... Poison pie? Right here we got another mycorrhizal mushroom. Obviously in a bowl of tasia with that, you can see the underside of that cap right there with all those pores. Pylopilus is the genus here. And you get it in uh, New Zealand, and a little bit on the uh, Australian mainland. But again, presumably associating with this Kunzia. Yeah, we got an Amanita coming up underneath there. Notorious mycorrhizal mushroom. Got a nice, nice sweet smell to it too. Look at that, that uh, very distinct cap texture. Looking like pan dulce. God, look at that cap texture. I love the cap texture, Amanese. Very nice to draw it too. It's just a persistent layer of tissue that remains on that cap as the cap expands and then breaks up. Look at this, meet this fantastic bastard, Cyathea dilbata, such a common species, grows like a freaking weed here in New Zealand. It's everywhere, you can see we're under a, a, a light canopy of uh, Kunzia, over there you got a wide variety of uh, Podocarpaceae, ancient conifer lines, you got Podocarpus totara and uh, the Critium cupressinum, the Rimu with that drooping pendant foliage over there, but this thing, this Cyathea is everywhere, it's a tree fern that uh, has these bright white uh, undersized to those pinnae. See that? And look, there you got the spores right there. You got the sporangia, the sori. All right. Clusters of sporangia. Look at that. What a what a fancy bastard. Probably just a lipid molecule, some sort of wax on the undersides of those leaves. You also got it on the fronds right here. All right. All right. Reminiscent of farina. Okay. We had Dennis Farina, too, who was probably kind of a schmuck, but I do like uh, putting his schnoz all over the place when I talk about plant wax. There you go. Scythia dilbata. Look, so there you go, you got the individual sori, those little balls, and they're covered by that indusium, which is that semi-translucent cap that just seems to be splitting open and dumping all the spores out. So what does a gametophyte, you know, of, because uh, you got the whole alternation of generations thing, of a cyathea tree fern look like? Probably not much. You probably wouldn't even notice it, but on a gametophyte, that's where the sperm and egg are going to bang. You get the antheridia, the archegonia. And are going to bang, they're going to produce a sporophyte, which is that, which is what you're looking at. So you got the gametophyte, you got the sporophyte, all right? In flowering plants, the gametophyte is just a pollen grain, okay? Or, uh, or an uh, egg inside a, an ovule. But, uh, you know, it's a little bit more complicated and a little bit more of a uh, quote-unquote primitive model for the ferns. But they, nobody, you know, body teachers don't like it when you say that, primitive model, because it's not really, but it's still, it's still around and kicking, you know? 
Anyway, that's where all magic happens. That's where, where it's where all the spores get dumped out. Those clusters of sporangia, you know, the sorry. Look, it looks like a turd, but it's actually just the root, right? That's the next step in plant evolution. You're gonna develop uh, roots that look like turds so humans don't step on them. I'm just kidding. I don't think human beings are gonna be around long enough for plants to evolve with us in that kind of capacity. I mean, it, it is already happening. There's a species of fertile area that's becoming more camouflaged uh, as a result of uh, humans picking the shit out of it in China, but holy shit, that's a massive Totara, look at that. We got a species of Caprosma flowering. See those dangling anthers, see that? Those filaments just spilling out, dangling bulls. So many Caprosma, of course, I think all of them are wind pollinated. Caprosma as a genus is wind pollinated and there's a lot of diversity in it here in the Southern Hemisphere, especially in Australasia. All right, coffee family, Rubiaceae, they're everywhere. Saw a few in South Africa as well. But there's those flowers. Seems like it's a little early, but uh, not showy, all right? Wind pollinated flowers are, of course, not showy because they don't need to be. They just dump it all out. So glabrous. Everything's so glabrous here. Nice Cahacatia dacrocarpus. Look at that fucking bark. Look, it's like a Rothko painting. It's like some abstract stuff. This is what the kids are doing these days. You know, when their parents take 120 grand out to send them to art school. They make art like that. I can't say I blame them. They're never going to do it as well as uh, nature does, but, you know, I guess you can try to come close. Beautiful bark, too. Look at that. Look at the geometry on it. This peeling stuff with all the lichens on it. God damn it. Oh, very pleasant forest. Very, very nice forest. Must have been paradise living here. No predators. Not many mammals, except for bats. A lot of cool reptile and bird diversity, though. Young Rimu. What a beautiful tree. This foliage looks a little rough, like it's got some sort of pathogen, but you can really see what's going on there. And then, of course, bird dispersed cones when they're going off. So you can see this is this is one of the tiniest orchids I've ever seen. Caribus chismanii, a common uh, early bloomer here in uh, the North Island, New Zealand. You can see that uh, what looks like a little helmet, and these are known as the helmet orchids, is actually a dorsal sepal. And then were you to, were you to tear that off, there'd be a labellum inside you can see they've just got that one leaf and they've got a little tuberous uh little uh little ball root down there that they come back from every year so they're a little perennial root but regardless they've got a pollination ecology which is extremely bizarre being here in the dark shady understory of this kunzia or any other forest you'll find them in cori forest too one of the primary pollinators that you're going to encounter are fungus gnats you wouldn't normally think of fungus gnats being a pollinator but being that it is so dark and shady and a lot of bees and our butterflies are not very active. Uh, you gotta you gotta work with what you got. So a lot of orchids have evolved fungus gnat pollination. Pterostylus is another genus that does that as well. And they probably rely on some sort of uh, either uh, emittance of pheromones or mimicry to get fungus gnats in there and effectively pollinating it, picking up one of those two pollinia, those uh, globules of uh, pollen grains, and uh, hopefully carrying them off to another flower uh, in which they'll uh, repeat the behavior. I'm laying down on the moss, but thankfully, supposedly there's not. The leeches aren't bad here, so you know Tasmania got terrestrial leeches. You can see what's above us. Just more of that Kunzia. And obviously a very healthy mycorrhizae in the ground too, since almost all orchids associate with fungus. With the uh, symbiotic fungus, so. Caribus chismaniae. So this is Cordineris. You know what species this is? I think it's Cordineris gemaeus. Of course, mycorrhizal with the Kunzia. Yeah. Oh, nice, almost purple texture. Yeah, slight purple. Slight tinge, purple yeah. at, the, at the base of that uh, cap. It's hygrophonous. Oh, yeah. You can just see. This is them, too, huh? Yeah. Popping up. So, Michael, tell me about this. This is uh, in the genus Pseudopanax, correct? Which is Aureliaceae, the English ivy family. Yeah. And these these leaves are notorious they these are the juvenile leaves right yeah and so they look a little the leaves change as they get older yeah it's a condition known as heteroblasty you know what the god what a beautiful that's a beautiful plant what, what so what do you know about this it evolved with mowers so that's mainly that's it's thought that that's mainly what heteroblasty is it's it's a result of evolution with mowers which are not extinct okay yeah yeah so that that's why it's got such leathery spiky leaves i guess so so what do the leaves look like when it's when it's older and out of the reach uh, of moas, presumably? The leaves start to branch out, get they get more 
palmate um, kind of? Yeah. I don't know if you can see any. It's got, it's got a beautiful architecture on it though, regardless. Yeah, and this one naturally hybridizes with the one we saw down the bottom. How many you different get, species of pseudopanus? Uh, you got quite a few here, huh? Yeah, maybe five, four or five, I think. That legend is supposedly the Maori used to, you know, it'd come by as this thing was pliable and as it was growing, and kind of bend it and keep bending it, and, you know, and eventually when you got a good four or five inches of growth for a nice handle on there, cut it off, you got a nice walking stick. I can see that. Very good wood. Very hard. I, I you know, I would, I would take a caning with uh, some pseudopanics. Look at that. They got a young egg at this, too. They got to put a tag on it that says protect it so some jackass doesn't come, come by and try to saw it down or do whatever. Yeah, I don't know what they do with it. And again, heteroblasty. All right, old agathis leaves and some of those coreys that are the size of giant sequoias look very different from the leaves on young trees. These are a little bit more, uh, a little bit more pokey and lanceolate, whereas they're more imbricate, like snake scales, and shorter and broader on older trees. Magnificent fucking tree, though. You know, recently we started a rumor. It's completely untrue about a botanist that we know. Just saying he's lewd and lascivious, and it was. I'm not even gonna name him because he's probably not a bad guy. He gets a little rowdy online. But uh, regardless, you know, it's it's a funny joke. It's ongoing, kind of an inside joke. We talk about him having, you know, a gimp suit and all these weird sex parties and stuff. But that's certainly how I feel looking at this uh, entoloma, right? I feel like it's lewd and lascivious. It's got a beautiful dark color, okay, kind of doing a goth thing. Nice uh, iridescence on that cap. And uh, even the stipe is quite attractive. Don't know what happened, don't know what happened to that cap right there, but... Uh, uh, not mycorrhizal, just a saprotrophic growing at the base of this kunzia, but regardless, you know, gotta be careful who you make jokes about, you know, because it's not malicious at all, but you never know when they're gonna find out that you've been, you know, saying or stashing in a closet full of dildos or poppers, all kinds of stuff, and when it's actually not true, but it's just kind of, the fact that they're, the, you know, not the type of person to do the kind of thing is what makes it so funny. Anyway, there you go. Wonderful entoloma here growing beneath the kunzia. There's that Ripagonum scandens, Ripagonaceae. I'm also looking like a Smilax, which I think it, uh, maybe at one point it was put in Smilaceae, but now it's in its own family. Liliales is the order. It's a, it's the monocot climbing vine. Super glabrous. Everything here is so waxy and glabrous. No hairs on any of these plants, just because of how damn cool and wet it is. Look at it. The only other species of Proteaceae endemic to New Zealand, and the only other species that grows in New Zealand, Teronia toru. All right, the other one's Nydia. Nydia's got red flowers, this has yellow. You can see those inflorescences is about to go off right there. Velvety orange. All right, otherwise you just got the rather simple leaf venation and kind of sclerophyllous, plasticky feeling leaves. Oh, Pseudopanax crassifolius. That person in the house down there probably thinks I'm, you know, trying to give video of them urinating or something. Who knows, you know, <laughs> just see some some loudmouth windbags standing outside your window shouting at plants. Anyway, nice illustration of heteroblasty. What is it an adaptation towards? Now extinct moas or something else? Who knows? Wonderful leaves regardless. You can see that serrate edge, serrate margin on those elongate leaves that are easily, Christ, they gotta be, what is it, 18 inches, 20 inches long? And of course they change uh, once the, the plant reaches, I don't know, a height of three meters or so. Beautiful leaves. God damn it, that's wild. You can see them just just almost really easy to miss. Got two more over there. See that? We got Agathis australis right here. We got the cori and the young leaf form also tr probably trying to make itself look unpalatable and uh, much different leaf shape. Exhibiting more heteroblasty as those leaves, as the, as the tree gets older, right? Much different leaves. Shorter, squatter, imbricate, denser. And then here we got Halocarpus kirkii, looking just like a damn torea. See that? Another heteroblastic plant. All right, heteroblasty, of course, is a trait that's converging among so many unrelated taxa here in New Zealand. And again, thought to be adaptations to now extinct moles. Look at those cute little quarries right there, huh? Crazy to think those things can reach, you know, what was the diameter of the big tree up north? Fuck, easily 40 feet across. 25 feet across, lived for 2,000 years. Halocarpus kirkii, so they got leaves that look like a U when they're young, and as they get older, once they top out, they get a, you can see any over there, and nah, not really. They get a more, you know, juniper looking leaves. There's three species of halocarpus here in New Zealand. Fucking wild. Unlike uh, members of the Redwood family, they don't have uh, decussate foliage, they got spiral phyllotaxy. If you look at those 
those leaves up close and how they emerge off that stem. Yes, don't mind me while I stand in the bushes and try to photograph you peeing. <laughs> I can't get over this. I can't get over the foliage here. I don't care that this thing is a flower and that it's winter time. The fucking leaves on Pseudopanax are blowing my mind. Never mind that members of the same genus, it's congeners as this species, Chrysophilus, can also have digitate, you know, large leaves that look completely quote unquote normal. This is insane. That is so fucking cool. I can't get over it. And they get, these can get upwards, I don't know, 20 feet tall. You know, what is it, four, five, six meters? Just incredible. You know, that big around, just a stick with the, it just looks like a stick made out of pins. I'm the bane of every suburban homeowner. I'm out here standing in your bushes looking in. And there's the adult foliage up there. Oh, that lancewood, that pseudopanax crassifolia, that's fucking nuts. That is insane. Look at that. Still got that leaf margin, somewhat reminiscent of what we just showed you. But, you know, it's loosening up, broadening out a little bit, collecting more light. Doesn't look so defensive, all right? It looks like it's been the therapy. I hope someone, I hope one of these homeowners can hear me right now, and it's making them a little uncomfortable. Can you believe that? Look at that. It's a fucking evolution classroom. Right here in a forest outside of these uh, Rich Stiffs house. Maybe they're nice people, you never know. Probably Rich Stiffs though. And there's the leaves. There's the heteroblasty of Halocarpus kirkia. Yeah, you see young foliage right there and the uh, adult foliage up there. Why does it do that? Why does it do that? So such fun stuff to think about. God damn it. So many, so many unrelated texts to do that. Why do they do that? Probably an adaptation to moas. What else could it be? Now extinct moas? What else? I'm gonna bark on that. Real nice. There you go. Nice, nice illustration. Oh shit. Oh, it's dead anyway. Man, New Zealand's so so regulation happy. They'd probably be jumping down my ass. You know, <laughs> filming myself breaking. Look how cleanly that abscises all that branch, that dead branch abscises. Anyway, nice money shot of a Cori cone here, Agathis australis. Again, 22 species in a genus. Look at that beautiful spiral. Not mature yet, got a ways to go. The mega stroboli, aka the female cones, take upwards of, a, I think, a year to a year and a half to uh, mature. That windborne pollen landed on there, uh, I don't know, probably a, a year ago, maybe six months ago. You gotta look at how to the pound. They take a while for the actual uh, sperm to get to the egg inside there, too. You know, it's quite weird. You look up uh, conifer, <laughs> conifer pollination. Pollination doesn't actually occur, or fertilization doesn't actually occur until a while after pollination has. So it's an involved process. Look at those nice trunks. Get at the critium compressing them over there in the background. How about that? Look at that robust fuck. That's nice. Look at it. God damn it. Look at those, the branching pattern. Ah, oh, what a great tree, man. Fuck, I'd love to see some of the ones up there when you get towards Indonesia and stuff. I've seen Ovada in uh, New Caledonia, another, another beauty. Lance a lot up there too, but oh, you can really see how it's just a monkey puzzle. Eric Ariasi. That's hilarious. Look at that. They're the same tree. Yeah. Pseudopanax crassifolius. See that? Right there. On the left. Young ones, and as they get older, the leaves broaden out. Make use of more surface area to collect more sunlight. Right at about the height of a moa, which again has only been extinct for about, I don't know, 400 years, 500 years. Fucking wild. That's oh, so cool. There you go. Perfect comparison of adult leaves and juvenile leaves. Same species. God, that's so cool. Look at that. Evolution is amazing, is it not? How long did it take for this trait to come up? And how? what is causing it to come up among so many unrelated taxa of, uh, of vascular plants? Fucking wild, man. Same species, the pseudopanax. And again, many unrelated species do this. It's called heteroblasty. This is a banger. Look at this. Phyloclatus toa toa. The third and final species of Phyloclatus that we've seen along with Trichomenoides and Alpinus. And this one is probably the most beautiful. Look at the, uh, look at those striations on the leaves. Jesus Christ, looking like ginkgo leaves mixed with that yellow stem. You got the Trichomenoides right here coming up next to it. So apparently they're not hybridizing. Look much different. And this is such a this is such a more beautiful species. All right, take me back to the Triassic. Look at this fucking thing. God, it's look at how it's got verticillate verticillations of leaves too. Look at that. So this is this is all the new growth 
for this year. God damn. What a cool, what a cool plant. Nice Rimu behind it. Pseudopanax, Crassifolius. Look at the fucking, I can't, I can't contain myself. More Trichomonoides. Such epic forests. Gania setifolia, the cutting grass, New Zealand's version of it. Got another species of Gania, Gania grandis in Tasmania. Look at this, look at this quarry slowly transitioning to the mature adult leaves. What a gorgeous tree, but maintaining that, that, that conical form. And much like the phylloclatus, you got verticillations, all right? A whole bunch of branches all at the same, verticillating phyllotex, a bunch of branches all at the same level. Protocarpus latus right there, looking like a Totara. Actually, this might be Totara. Latus is here too, though, much, a little bit longer of uh, needles. Look at that, look at that. Ah, oh, look at the pseudopanax, man. Is that not nice to look at? Look at this, look at these stems. Used to be used as spears by the Maori. Look at that, just a monocolous bastard. No leaves until 12 feet up that thing. That, of course, is an adult, so you've got broader leaves. It's got the adult foliage. These still have the juvenile. Incredible forests. Nice specimen of Cordyline Banksii, convergent evolution with the yucca. This thing, of course, can get upwards of 20 feet tall, maybe 15 feet tall, so five to six meters. Look at this mean Rubus. Look at this fucking raspberry. Ah, uh, Rubus cisoides. The bush lawyer, because it because it clings on to you and it doesn't let go. Anyway, even cooler, Caprosma arborea. Capro Caprosma, of course, is one of those meh genera coffee family Rubiaceae. They're wind pollinated, but look at this one. Look at the undersides of those leaves. Look at that that russety bronze. Looks like this thing is just trying not to get noticed when you look up. I can't even get the camera to focus. Let's see if I can go in there. And look at that, that's another thing you see among a lot of the plants here is these spoon-shaped leaves, long petioles. What is the adaptive benefit of that? Such fun questions to think about. Probably got something to do with moas. I could be totally wrong, but that's what I'm leaning towards because a lot of unrelated plants have converged on this kind of uh, leaf shape. Such a cool habit, look at that. See, it's, I've, I've lit it up right now, but if it's not lit up, you look up. You can almost you can barely can barely see it, especially if it's you know at night, right? Contrast that with the bright white undersides that a lot of plants have if they're uh, you know trying to from arid climates if they're trying to uh, prevent uh, transpiration of, of moisture from their stomata. Look at that thing, just blends in. You can barely see it. Caprosma arborea. What a fucking weird. Just showing relics of uh, the now extinct moa. Presumably, who knows. Look at this Kunzia robusta. Look at it. Look at the leaves up there. They just barely touch. It's almost psychedelic. See that? Just little rivers of atmosphere in between. All that that dense that dense canopy of leaves is all at the same level. Probably look really cool if you were on mescaline. But we certainly don't need to be on mescaline to appreciate you, do we? Helps a little bit, you know. It it really does. But you certainly don't need it. Look at that. Look how fucking gorgeous it is. I could just lay on my back and look up at that all day. Nice Blechnum Fraseri right here, a stalked Blechnum. Looking like a mini tree fern almost. God, that's wild. <laughs> a coalescent stalked Blechnum. Blech. Show me your sporophylls. Look at this, look at this Fraysonetti, another creeping monocot. It's a climber actually. You'll see it climbing up stuff. It's got, it produces an edible fruit. See, it's climbing up. I can't even tell what that is, an old tree fern or something. It's climbing up. Pandanaceae. So it's related to pandanus, AKA to screw pines. Big yellow pineapple looking fruit when it's uh, in fruit. So all these podocarps have to be very shade tolerant, just like redwoods. When they're young, they tolerate shade, but they can also grow up and get up into the canopy. Look at this Remu, look at this massive Remu. You got Remu foliage everywhere, all over the ground, mixed with the tree fern foliage. Look at it, massive Cyatheas, and then a Remu that's just covered in epiphytes. What a great tree, man. What a fucking cool forest. Why would you want to plant shitty radiata pine in Leland Cypress and other, 
<laughs> all the other trash they plant down here is windbreaks, Lombardi poplars. I know podocarps take a while to grow, but that's why you're not supposed to cut them down in the first place, jackass. Look at that thing. That monolithic beast. How many hundreds of years old? Jesus Christ. The Critium Capressinum, the Rimu. Pendant foliage, but when it's when old trees, you don't see the, the, the pendants. You don't see them more than like a foot. They don't get very long. Only on the, you know, adolescent trees. When they're full grown, it's, they stay rather short. God, that is such a fucking great beast. Look at that thing. Just, just covered in astelias. Got old Freysinetia climbing up there. Jesus Christ. Any Metrosideros on there too? The climbing Metrosideros that start out as vines and then turn into trees. Such great forest, man. Nothing here's going to hurt you. Yeah, the Ropolo stylus sapita right there with the tree fern. Very cold tolerant palm. New Zealand's only native palm. Pretty rare plant right here. All right, and remember, very species species risk genus asterisk. This is Brachyglottis kirkii. Totally glabrous. Leaves feeling almost succulent. Notice those red stems, alternate leaves, and uh, of course, a member of the sunflower family, Asteraceae. Right, which it kind of does look like, but uh, this is just, you could tell this is from a very wet environment. Big white flowers when it blooms, reflected moonlight blooming at the night. Tells you something there. There's that first thing that speaking of bat pollination, you can see it uh, climbing up that uh, tree fern right there. There's another one. Those are definitely bat pollinated. Those, and they, they produce again, those, those delicious edible fruits. Bracket gladys. We've seen plenty of bracket gladys. Saw a couple woolly ones up in the mountains, but to see a, a glabrous one down here, it's pretty cool. Look at those. Look at a rackies on this Cyathea medullaris. Looks like it's a damn foot of a giant bird or something. That's why they had to cut it down for trail maintenance. But here's another genus in the same order uh, as that Cyathea, another genus, the tree fern. Dixonia. This is Dixonia squarosa. Very stiff, scabbard feeling leaf. Not as flimsy, not as flexible as the Cyathea. Can't find any story on it, so I can't show you for a comparison. But uh, Cyathea and Dixonia, even though they're in different families, are again in the same order. Pretty close related. Look at the red stem on that, that Dixonia too. And just another, another tree fern doing its thing here. Of course, you also get Dixonia antarctica down there in Tasmania, which is a huge tree fern. It's quite big around and keeps the skirt of leaves on it. And that really nice illustration of the devaricating habit. See that? Why the fuck would a plant do that? Why would so many dozens of unrelated lineages of plants do that unless there was something selecting for it over millions of years? That makes absolutely no sense. This is Karokia cotoneaster. It is in... Fuck, I can't I forget the name. I think it's, think it's uh, Argophyllaceae. It's one of the Asterales. But either way, you can see the way birds eat an herbivorous bird. That would be a fucking nightmare. It would take you forever to get all the leaves on this. You'd be picking around the branches, created a cage, basically, to keep you know the bird's head out from the center of the plant. You got leaves all the way up in there. God, it's so weird. And it makes sense when you start to think about it. You're basically creating, it's a, it's a really weird and unique form of defense from herbivory. Do you think I'm lying? Huh? You think the divarication in the plants here is not real? Look at that, Carpoditis serratus. Completely different family than the one I just showed you. Rusiaceae is the family, little known southern hemisphere family in the sunflower order, Asterales. But it's doing the same divaricating thing. And like another plant, it's also got another unrelated plant, Caprosma arboreum, and a few others. It's got these, these russety undersides to the leaves which can be very hard to see when you're beneath one in a dark forest and this is an understory plant so if you're you know birds herbivorous birds are foraging by vision all right they're not smelling stuff like mammals are they're foraging by vision you look up you can barely look at that you can barely see it just looks shady blends in with a dark background like the shady canopy of a fucking forest that these grow under so again, multiple unrelated families all converging on the same tactics because of millions of years of selection pressure with these fucking probably really cool birds that uh, are now extinct. See what a pain in the ass that would be to eat and see that? How are you going to do that? You got little leaves, big nodes between them, all these weird branches, you know, weird branching patterns to prevent you from getting in there. 
part of the co-evolutionary arms race between uh, flightless moas and other, other avian herbivores and uh, the native plants in New Zealand.